execute. Carry on. Keep calm and warp on. Punch it, Chewie. Go, go, go. Hit that button. Go forward. Move it. Uh, it's actually a lot harder than it seems to come up with a good warp thing. <laughs> Hello interwebs and welcome to my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 8, The Sanctuary! 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 I'm sorry folks, this is just what you're gonna deal with when I do reviews at midnight. But yes, as always, I'm going to be giving my spoiler-free overview thoughts up front, and then we're gonna dive into the nitty-gritty spoilers of the episode after I give a warning. So if you haven't seen the episode yet, we're totally cool! It's a safe space, we're gonna have fun, it's like it's like a, it's like it's a sanctuary. For all of you who haven't seen the episode, you see what I'm doing? I'm gonna stop. This is a weird night for me. I don't know why I'm so giggly today. Anyways, what did I actually feel about this episode? Well, for The Sanctuary, I feel it's falling into that camp that I've had with a few other episodes this season where I feel like the plot, there's nothing particularly egregious or bad about it. There's nothing I'm pointing to say, I hate that or I think that that's bad or horrible or this really bothered me. But there's also nothing that really surprises me or engages me either. I had the same problem with the last episode that focused on the Emerald Chain, which this episode does, the sort of Andorian Orion syndicate crime syndicates thing that's uh, been built up all season. There was nothing that really stuck out to me about the main, you know, plot uh, story arc throughout the episode that really said like, yes, that was a cool idea or that was a cool thought or that was something new I've seen. There was actually a couple moments during the main like plot beats that I kind of had my eyes sort of glazed over because I'm like, all right, I know exactly how this scene's gonna go. I don't really, I don't really expect anything surprising to happen here. It was just sort of like, all right, here happened, this happened, this happened. It was very standard sort of like, crime syndicate comes into the situation and, and you know, takes advantage and the Federation comes in and tries to, uh, you know, stop it in their own unique way. With a couple of little clever twists given the setup of this season of where the Federation is. So I will say there was a couple interesting ideas, but overall the plot was all fairly fine. But like the other episodes of the season where I thought the plot was fine, the episode really stands strong and stands out on its small character moments. And I actually think, unlike uh, Scavengers, which is the other episode that I really felt this way about where it sort of had a fine plot, the character-centric pieces in this episode were absolutely phenomenal. And some of my favorite character moments of the entire season, uh, namely, I will point to Tilly, had some really subtle moments uh, throughout the episode. I think Mary Wiseman portrayed a really excellent evolution of Tilly here that really worked. There was also some great humor. There was also some great uh, backstory and building out for the character of Book, who's um, been kind of relegated to the sidelines for pretty much most of the season outside of the first episode. So it was nice to kind of give him a front and center look this episode. Again, his backstory wasn't anything surprising, but it was nice to kind of flesh him out, and I thought it built out his chemistry with the rest of the characters uh, even more so. One other thing, too, I will say, you know, as a trans person, there's some really wonderful stuff involving the LGBTQ community angle of this, particularly around the characters of Adira and Stamets. I, uh, and Culber, too, to a small degree. Uh, and I'll talk about that more in the spoiler section, because I have many thoughts on that, as I'm sure many of you already assumed if you've seen the episode. Uh, but I really think that they were really small, but very meaty moments throughout the episode that I, I, I deeply loved and adored and were probably my favorite moments. And, and I know I'm a little biased in that, considering, you know, who I am and my identity and, and my love of seeing my uh, my type of representation on screen for, for uh, the LGBTQ community in general. But even if trying to look past that, I really do think the Stemets, Culber, and Adira stuff in this episode were great. There's also some small stuff with George O here that was fine, but it was sort of like another one of those like bridging the gap sort of things. It, it didn't necessarily feel like there was all that much new information here. It was just sort of like, all right, we're going from here to here so we can get to the next episode. The one thing I will mention as I close up my spoiler-free thoughts on this is I really appreciate that while this episode was mostly filler, it didn't feel like it was anything meaning. Like if you took this episode out of this season, it didn't feel like you would miss all that much with a few pieces, um, you know, coming from the Emerald Chain. Uh, notwithstanding, uh, it feels like this episode is filler, but I like that it kind of acknowledged that and didn't try to lie to me and do this sort of like, oh, fetch questy kind of thing where it's like, oh, we're going to go to this planet and we're going to get another piece of, uh, going to get another piece of the, the burn quest and, and then that'll get us to the next piece. It was very much like, no, we're going to be dealing with a whole new situation. I like that this episode was sort of completely divorced for the most part outside of one scene from the burn. And it didn't try and like make 
it seem like this was going to be an important episode. And really, it, it ultimately was just a smaller character piece. This is the problem that I've seen in earlier episodes of this season, but also in The Mandalorian as well, where it kind of cuts back between like, this is a really important episode, and then the next episode's like, it's gonna be a really important episode, but really it's just kind of stalling the wheels and we're gonna pretend that it's important so we can get to the next episode, which is gonna have the actual important thing. Uh, it's sort of that like fetch questy side quest sort of thing that always kind of bothers me. And I like that this episode is very much upfront with all of that. So in conclusion, before I get into spoilers, I think that this is a good episode made slightly better by its really, really strong character moments uh, that I deeply, deeply enjoyed. But overall, in terms of just main, you know, arc of the plot, it was okay. But that's all of my spoiler free thoughts. If you haven't seen the episode yet, please stop now or, you know, keep watching if you want to. I'm not going to judge you because uh, I'm going to be delving into full spoilers. As per usual, I'm going to be going scene by scene and sort of discussing every single moment throughout the episode as I saw it, but I'm going to change it up a little bit. Normally, I go through the episode chronologically, at least mostly chronologically, but there were a few storylines in this episode that were all kind of separated from the main arc of things. Like, they touched and weaved into the main plot, but generally they were fairly separate. The first one that I want to touch on is the one that starts off the episode, which is the Culber and Giorgio plot, where Giorgio uh, learns a little bit more about what's going on with her. As I spoke about in my spoiler-free section, this whole plot line just sort of felt like a treading-in-place bit, where it's like, all right, we know something's wrong with Giorgio, we kind of need to move it forward a little bit to sort of touch upon it, but we don't want to get to it yet. So we're having this whole Culber plot where Culber learns a little bit more about um, about her. And there were some moments in there I like. As always, Giorgio is really relatively funny. Um, it was nice seeing her interact with a different type of character other than Burnham because her main interactions on the show are generally with Burnham a little bit with Saru. So it was nice to see her get a little bit more stuff with Culber here. Uh, and I like that Culber, while being the counselor of the ship this season, essentially, he's, he's essentially the counselor. That's basically what he's become in that first scene of the episode, which was uh, very aggressive, by the way. The first scene between Culver and Jojo that opens up the episode was like very like up to an 11, which is like a very weird place to start an episode. Uh, it was it was all written fine, but it was just like the intensity was just a lot. Um, but I, I overall, I liked seeing her interact with Culver and being much more reserved that she's she's someone who likes to portray being tough and and showing this cold exterior like I can handle anything and that she doesn't want to be seen as vulnerable because that's the whole problem here. She just does not want to be seen as vulnerable and she does not want to open up to anyone. Uh, Michael Burnham is probably the closest she comes to, but really no one else can get through. And I like that Culber kind of acknowledges that and pushes on her and says like, I'm going to be forceful. We've seen Culber be this open, caring, um, you know, empathetic guy. But then in this episode, when he's dealing with Jojo, he's very much like, no, all right, I'm going to be the stone wall. I'm going to push back. I'm going to hit you hard in order to make you see the truth of what's going on with you. So I, I like that he he was a bit more of a, able to adjust his his uh, capabilities to the person in the situation. I still find it weird that he's the counselor essentially when he really was a medical doctor. I I, I just wish they had just like get, like he's the counselor now. Clearly feels to me like that's the role they want him to play this season, but because of stuff that they were doing earlier in the show, he couldn't step into that role. Uh, he just has to be this like weird amalgam of doctor and counselor. But that's really all I have to say on that. There are some good beats where like Giorgio learns that she's dying and then she wants to rush off to save Burnham. But again, Culver pushes back on her. Uh, the weird like thing when her head splits off and like the new medical technology and seeing what new medical technology can do in the 31st century or 32nd century, I should say, was kind of cool. But generally it was just like, yeah, treading in place pot. I get it. There's some good moments, but generally it's okay. The next piece is one that I am definitely going to be talking quite a bit about, and that is the Adira and Stemet story. Again, I figured most of you would presume that I would have many, many thoughts on this. Uh, and the first scene that we really get with them after sort of the, the burn explanation and info dump, which I'll talk about a little bit later on in my review, probably next after this. But the first scene that we get with Stemets and Adira is this really wonderful scene where Adira essentially says, you know, I use they, them pronouns and just comes out to Stemets. The scene itself, I think, was really beautifully portrayed. I like that Adira kind of just like blurts it out because that's how a lot of trans people feel in that moment when they come out to somebody. They just sort of blurt it out and just say, I'm trans because you're just like, I just need to say it. I'm so scared of saying it. I'm just going to get it out there. And once it's out there, I, I can't take it back. And so it just comes out of like this like damn burst and you're like, ah, and say it. And I just love this like kind of like, like awkward smile that Stemmets has on face. Anthony Rep plays it beautifully where he's like kind of proud and he's kind of like, he wants to like show pride, but he also doesn't want to like overplay the moment because he knows that it's 
hard for them, hard for Adira to to say this. So there's that mixture of pride, but also wanting to be to be there in the moment and not, you know, you know, be too out of it. And I think Anthony Rep just plays it wonderfully. He just gives that beautiful face that like kind of have smile like, mm, yeah, I got it, I get it. Um, and Adira just saying like, hey, look, I, I haven't told anyone this. And Stemis is like, honored by that. Um, doesn't say anything either though. He's just like, yeah, that's fine. And that is the perfect way someone should accept someone coming out. Just when someone comes out to you, you just sort of like listen and say, yeah, okay. And then just go on as normal. That's what happened to me. I was lucky enough when I came out as a trans person, uh, I came out to my best friend who is still my best friend to this day. And I came out, I said everything I needed to say. And then we just talked about video games. And it was the most wonderful thing. It was like this big thing that was so important to me and I thought would change how everyone saw me. But my friend just like, okay, I accept that. Let's talk about video games. That's how you do that. And I thought that this scene portrayed that wonderfully. The other thing too, one of the big worries that I had, and I spoke about this in my previous episode, is I found it bothersome that no one bothered to ask Adira's pronouns. Um, I feel like, and, and this is a whole other discussion I've talked about before, and I'll link probably down below if I remember to, to a video I talk about why I think pronoun sharing is so important to be doing, regardless of whether a trans person's in the room, because you could get it wrong, you could get someone's pronouns wrong. And I had always kind of headcanoned that in the Star Trek future, we all would just be doing that anyways. We'd just say, hey, what's your name? Hey, what's your pronouns? And that just became sort of standard, but we just never saw it on the show. That was sort of my headcanon to try and fix that as a trans person. And I know some people in the audience are like, oh, no, no pronouns. We wouldn't do that. This is, this is my own feelings on it. And so I like that this scene kind of sidesteps that issue in a way. While I wish Star Trek had always had pronoun sharing, obviously it wasn't going to be a thing in the 60s, uh, but I, I was worried that this show was going to kind of make that canon that they never did, that it's like, you know, Adira is going to get very upset and say, hey, why didn't you ever ask my pronouns? You should have, you know, you've been misgendering me this whole time. But the episode didn't take that tact. In fact, it was just sort of like Adira had just come out for the first time and said, I just figured it out. Um, I haven't really shared it with anyone other than Gray and now you, and I just need to say it. And so it kind of sidestepped that issue of being like, well, no, uh, Adira hadn't been misgendered before because they hadn't been out yet. They hadn't figured it out yet. Um, there's a bit of an awkwardness, like it's played like a big deal. And I also want, and I would have thought by this time in the Star Trek future, especially by the 32nd century, especially, but maybe things have regressed because of the burn and things like that in terms of cultural and social dynamics. But I would have thought that people would just be coming out as non-binary all the time by then. But this is the problem when you have a 50 year old franchise trying to, you know, evolve itself and, and sort of fit all of its canon elements. And also, you know, we're still all learning about trans stuff. And so this is me sort of, overly wishing and I acknowledge that of like I wish that this is the way the future was and maybe it will be by the time we get there but obviously Star Trek is reflecting the now and so that's just where we're at um so yeah I know that that's sort of like a little bit of it like trans 201 for a little bit of you but I I, I really appreciated the scene because it managed to sidestep some of the issues and worries that I had with uh with how trans representation was going to be done I should say non-binary I I I I generally use transgender as sort of an umbrella term that includes non-binary. I apologize if anyone's bothered by that, but that was just sort of my, that's just how I sort of view it as like non-binary is a member of the transgender community umbrella. Um, and I can discuss that in another video, but otherwise a really beautiful scene. The rest of the scene between these two was also really, really beautiful. I loved the scene where Stemitz goes in and listens to uh, Adira play the violin. I love that Adira opens up to Stemitz about, you know, not being able to talk to Gray and Stemitz just listens and accepts. And again, the same thing here, he just says, listens, accepts, acknowledges it, and then says, let's play, let's play music. And just accepts it, acknowledges it, and moves on. And then the last scene of the episode between them, I really loved where you get to see like the the queer family, the LGBTQ family of uh, Stemmets and Culber sort of like being parents and just taking care of them. I thought that that was a really beautiful scene. And you really start to feel like this LGBTQ chosen family sort of vibe going on there. And I really appreciate Discovery for sharing that, that a lot of LGBTQ members do make a chosen family with other members of the LGBTQ community. And I really appreciated that. And there was even a seeding of that with Culbert in the George Joe scenes where George Joe sort of mentions something about children and Culbert snaps back, well, I would have had children if I had the time or something, something along those lines. So there's this nice little like, you know, nudge in the back of your brain that, oh, m you know, Culber and Stemmets maybe wanted kids um, and, and see this as a way to sort of have that family. So I really loved that whole storyline. I thought despite its briefness throughout the episode, it was really, really beautiful.
I almost forgot to mention my thoughts about the burn development in this episode. I like that we were getting a little bit more tantalizing hints of what's going on with the burn and tying it into that musical piece that we saw throughout the season already. Uh, I'm kind of curious to see where it goes. It feels weird that it just turns out that the music was a Federation signal, but maybe that will still tie into the music. Because I actually kind of liked the idea that there was this musical theme running throughout the the galaxy. I thought that that was really uh, a cool idea. So if it really just turns out to have been for this moment where it's like, oh yeah, it was just a Federation distress signal, uh, I'll be kind of disappointed that they sort of tossed away a really cool thought for something so simple. But uh, I can't really judge it until we get a little bit further and, and sort of see where it goes. So it's one of those, I hope it's it pays off well. I'm curious about it, but I'm a little bit concerned because they seemingly tossed away a really cool concept for something a bit more standard that it's like, oh, it's just a Federation signal. But now that I've talked about those little side elements, it's about time that I talk about the main plot of this episode, which again, I found to be fairly standard. Um, it's sort of a very typical plot of, you know, Book needs to go back home in order to save his uh, family who have basically succumbed to this sort of, sort of like, you know, evil gang, the Emerald Chain that we've been building up this whole season. Um, and he goes back and he has problems with his family who has sold out and then they're going to sell him out because it's, it's uh, like I've seen this kind of story in like mobster plots and and similar things like that before there was nothing all that unique we also finally got to see osira in this episode in her first scene i literally just understood it's like okay she's just standard mob villain uh the actress doesn't really do anything badly uh for osira the head of the emerald chain but she doesn't really have as all that much charisma either she's not really engaging so i'm just sort of like kind of bored watching her she she's nothing egregious She's just not all that fascinating to watch. So her first scene with her cousin, the guy from uh, Scavenger, who also wasn't all that charismatic, uh, was just sort of like, all right, he's gonna, she's gonna kill her brother, her cousin, and and he's gonna die by the transforms. I get it, she's evil. Uh, didn't really shock or surprise me there. The other thing too, I will say with Osira, one of the weird things is I love seeing a Orion woman in charge. It just reminds me of that Star Trek Enterprise episode. I know shocker, Jesse being reminded of a Star Trek Enterprise episode where the Orions, we learn that Orion slave women are actually the leaders of Orion society and that it's this big secret thing that they are able to use their pheromones. Uh, I, I'm kind of glad to jettison that from canon because it's uh, it was like a weird thing where it's like, yeah, we're trying to get rid of the slavery of women by saying that all the men are actually enslaved which is you know also really bad so I, i'm glad that that's sort of being ignored but it just did weirdly remind me of that of like is she gonna use her weird orion pheromone stuff here uh it just sort of brought it back up when i when saru made mention of the fact that orions used to be slaves themselves which technically according to enterprise canon is not true but like i said uh, I, I'm more than happy to let that that little piece of canon just uh, be forgotten. However, I do like, as I said, all the character focused moments throughout this plot. I really loved the moments between Book and Burnham where uh, Book wants to go back to save his home. He comes to Burnham for help. Um, Burnham listens and wants to help him, but then she goes to Starfleet, the thing that she should be doing um, in order to try and get help and, and manage to convince Admiral Vance to do that. I also like the small moments of chemistry between Book and Burnham throughout the episode. I love the scene where uh, Book is talking to Burnham about wanting to show her uh, his home and getting a chance to actually explore his home. I really, uh, I liked that he's, He's not just worried about his situation, but he also like is just excited to share things that he loves about his his world and his life with this person that he has feelings for. That's that's what you get when you're in a relationship. You just get excited to show things to the person that you care about, share share these things that you love. And so I like that small little beat when they're running in the corridor there. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, also, the other thing here too is I really love the moments with Tilly and Saru. Um, last episode, I talked about my hesitations with Tilly being promoted to first officer. And I talked a little bit about it more on Trek Central when I went on there for their live stream uh, last weekend where I just we had like a full discussion it was like 30 minutes on on this topic and and why we found it to be a bit uh rushed uh to put it mildly however that being said I really liked Tilly's portrayal in this episode especially Mary Wiseman's portrayal there is a small subtle thing that I noticed uh in Mary Wiseman's portrayal of Tilly is that she never stammers if you go back and watch all the episodes of Star Trek Discovery prior to this Tilly always is like but, but, but she always has like this stammer here but throughout this episode Tilly never stammers. I was like actually actively paying attention to it once I started noticing it. And, and I love that. It's a small, subtle shift to show 
that Tilly's much more confident in this role. And it was just a great acting choice by by Mary Wiseman here that I really, really adored. But I also never feel like, outside of one moment with, with Rin, um, which might have been a little bit in joking. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, outside of one moment with Rin, I never felt like she overstepped her bounds. She is acting first officer here. And so I like that she feels more confident. She feels like she's engaged, but she doesn't feel like she's fully like, I'm the number one, going to boss everyone around sort of deal. Um, I like that it was actually a little bit more of a subtle thing that she just has more confidence, but she still feels like an acting first officer. So I really... Excuse me, really appreciated that. I also really loved the running joke uh, throughout the episode of Saru trying to find his like warp thing, uh, like his engage, his make it so, um, or whatever it would be. Uh, and, and so I thought that that was a funny little recurring joke. And I like the moment where like, it's sort of like a secret thing that Tilly's like, I'm not going to say anything as they're going through the corridor. That was a, a just a fun little recurring joke. I actually have been really loving the recurring jokes throughout this season. Like uh, like uh, uh, the the fact that Linus is shedding uh, this throughout this episode earlier this season where Linus was making the teleporter jumps. I, th- I thought those like recurring gags and episodes were all really, really good. I, I've generally just all enjoyed them. I also like Saru's sort of uh, masterminding uh, the whole situation and sort of playing it safe while also like trying to do the most good. He Saru is just such a really brilliant captain throughout this this whole season, really, where he's able to play the the middle ground and sort of maneuver and negotiate things to get what they want and frame it in a way that uh, allows Discovery to go where they need to go. Um, it, you see that in the scene with Admiral Vance where Burnham's like, we need to go do this. We need to go save um, Burnham, our book's um, home planet. And Admiral Vance is very much against that. But Saru's like, well, what if we go as an observer? Just sort of show our presence, wave the flag, as it were. And that Admiral Vance is amenable to. And so I like those small like little moments where Saru is able to reframe things in order to be more convincing, a skill that Burnham hasn't learned. And I like that sort of like clear distinction between the two. Um, I think is really smartly done and, and truly excellent, uh, I think, uh, by the writers and Doug Jones um, in his portrayal of Saru. Wonderful, wonderful, subtle job there. And then, you know, throughout the rest of this standard plot, uh, I thought that there was some like nice little gamesmanship that he had where he's like, okay, so I don't want to have the Federation appear like it's doing overstepping here, but I also want to like per Starfleet's orders, you know, uh, like the over our, our arching idea of Starfleet is to step in where we can and try and stop people from from hurting others. And so finding a way to get around that, I think there was just uh, some really great moments there uh, for him. I also should, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the stuff with Book and his home planet. I think the look of his home planet was really beautiful. And again, I liked the idea that we were getting a little bit more backstory for Book. It was all fairly standard. Like when I saw his brother and I saw this like push and troll between the two of them, he's like, oh, you don't consider it home. You're too righteous, but you were the one that came to the the mob essentially. And then, you know, you need to stand up to her and, and it's all fairly standard. I liked the portrayal of the brother. I also liked the fact that his brother was of a different ethnicity as book, at least as far as I could tell. I liked that sort of multi-ethnic family. I thought that that was a nice, subtle little, uh, you know, world building element there. But yeah, I, I generally found that all to be rather fine. It was, again, not bad. And I like that we're getting more evolution of uh, book as a character, that he's sort of like this righteous guy who sort of was on the outs with his family a little bit, but sort of gets back in towards the end. Um, but it didn't really stand out to me as anything super exciting to to talk about to be very honest with you the only thing really that stood out to me uh is like egregious though was um when they're fighting his brother down on the planet as he's trying to capture them they look up in the sky and they see uh osira's ship and this is a problem that has happened throughout modern trek and even in older trek too i think is uh as to a lesser degree um was like things in orbit should not look that close like book was able to like pick out his ship fighting osira's ship and and that would not be the case he would not be able to do that if they were actually as far out as we see when we cut to actually out in outer space. It's a small little, like, silly thing. It's like the same thing in Star Trek 2009 where Spock was on that planet where he's watching Vulcan be destroyed where he wouldn't clearly would not have been able to see it. He would not have been that close to it. Uh, it just, I get it, but it just is kind of annoying and egregious, but it's a small, subtle thing. I'm not going to, I've hammered on, I've honestly talked about it more than it, than it needed to be talked about, but just a small little like eh, thing that got to me. But the last thing I really have to mention is, is Detmer. I really love that that Detmer finally got to take front and stage in a, in a couple sequences here that were absolutely lovely. Uh, I also, but dear God, I've been joking about this before, but, uh, but I've, I've truly believed it, but definitely here like, oh, oh, and Detmer, hundred percent a thing. I swear to God, if they do not kiss by the end of the season, I will be 
very, very angry. Because they are just hinting at that all the way. Like the moment where um, Detmer's on the bridge with OO and OO says like, you know, you you need to believe in yourself. You, you, I, I forget the exact line, but there was just that wonderful like moment between the two of them where OO was giving confidence to Detmer. I, I adore that and I really love that subtlety there. But I also love that Rin goes with Detmer on the ship to try and take down the Osiris ship. And uh, Detmer is the one that gives the confidence boost to Rin. And you can kind of see this connection between like, she's facing her PTSD in this moment, overcoming that. And she's sort of giving that confidence booster to Rin, but also saying it to herself. Um, that was a fun little bit. And I like to see that we got like a hot shot pilot moment. And I like at the end, you know, where she's just joking with all of her her comrades. I thought that that was a, a fun little moment. And again, another like hint at Detmer and Owo Owo or a thing. Uh, so I, I, I thought that that was all really wonderful. And the actress who plays Detmer, I think did a very wonderful, job for finally being able to take front stage uh for the first time really in the entirety of the show so i'm, I'm really loving that the the small side characters are getting a little bit more and more to do each and every episode the one negative thing i will say about the detmer sequence is i wasn't entirely sure what she was actually doing at any particular moment it did feel weird that she was this one small ship that was able to take out this like scimitar beast of a a vessel while I understand that Rin had knowledge of the ship and could help in that regard, it was just, I wish I knew a little bit more of what exactly she was doing as the ship pilot. That all being said, though, I love that when she goes to manual, she gets the handles. It just reminded me of the joystick that we see in Star Trek Generations. Absolutely hysterical, and I like any callback to that weird, weird moment of Star Trek canon. The last two things that I really want to mention is I, I liked Rin this episode. I found that he was a bit more interesting. I'm glad that he was brought back for this. Uh, I was a bit kind of hesitant on his inclusion earlier in the season because I was like, hey, so he was fine there, but he didn't really do anything especially exciting for me. So I like that he was brought back up here and he was sort of like this outsider character who sort of saw the Federation as this um, sort of bad entity or like there's always a catch sort of thing sort of like on the oust with the Federation but starting to appreciate them a little bit more um, I, I like that I also loved all of his scenes with Tilly uh, for those of you who don't know the actor who plays Rin is also Mary Wiseman's real life husband so the moment where you know it, it was a bit much for Tilly in the moment in the scene where she's like give the captain the respect he deserves that felt a little bit like a too much overstepping Tilly like she's a little bit too confident as XO uh, but you could also get that that makes sense in canon that she's like trying to uh you know over over compensate as xo to like say show him the deference he deserves but it also played a little bit more like an in-joke like she gets to insult her husband i'm sure the writers were having fun with those moments and then the uh scene at the end where he opens up to her was uh, also had that sort of subtextual meaning of the fact that they are husband and wife in real life so i thought that that was like a fun little meta beat that they hit with that um which was uh deeply enjoyable and then I like that the note that the episode ends on where Book, after going through this whole adventure and saying, like, the Federation saved my my planet, he starts to become a true believer, as he was talking about in the beginning of the season. He's starting to believe in the Federation and wants to join the Federation and become a Starfleet officer. I kind of figured that that's where his character was going. They kind of hinted at that where he's like, I don't know what I'm doing on this ship. I, I kind of figured that it kind of fits the themes of the season of, like, reigniting this hope in the Federation so it fit that Book would want to do that. Um, maybe it was a little bit fast here, um, but I generally think that that's a good move for his character. I think it'll be interesting to sort of see this Han Solo-esque character become more integrated into Starfleet. I, I kind of think that'll be sort of an interesting way to see that. Maybe a sort of a, uh, very similar to Tom Paris, uh, over in Star Trek Voyager. It might be a sort of similar sort of, um, vibe going on there. So I, I really appreciated that. And I just really appreciate the chemistry uh, between Book and Burnham. It really reads so, so strongly, especially I, I've gone back and rewatched a few episodes of season one with Burnham and Voke um, or Ash Tyler, as it were. And there's just no chemistry there between the two of them. Nothing against Shazad Latif or Sonequa Martin-Green. Just sometimes there isn't chemistry between two actors. And so it's really noticeable now um, between these two characters that I think they just have such strong chemistry together and it really shines through in almost every single scene that they have together. And I deeply enjoyed that that was the note the episode ended on. All right, well, that is everything that I had to say about this episode. I know my review was a little bit uh, more scattered or at least more segmented than I typically do, but did you appreciate me doing it that way? Did you not? I'd love to hear all your thoughts down in the comments below. Uh, what's your favorite warp thing? Did I come up with any funny ones or good ones for you? Um, let me know also down in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more reviews of Star Trek, more reviews of The Mandalorian, more discussions of uh, different issues like LGBTQ issues in pop culture and geekery. That's all right here on this channel. 
channel. I also have a Patreon page uh, if you want to help me out over there. But beyond any of that, whether you subscribe, comment, or help me out on Patreon, I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Thank you to all of my patrons this month, but especially Amanda Ronye Idanya, Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Bergmoss, Ashlyn Solstice, Michael D., Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Ulysses the Pagan, Randy Thompson, Munir Amlani, Chamomile T., Stefan Schuhart, Wellington Marcus, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Wayne Twitchell, Ish the Mad, Buttoneer, Roar, Christina Dalliance, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Michael Beam. She sells seashells by the seashore of Bajor. William Stewart, Gavin Robinson, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F., Nathan Olson, Jason Knott, Andrew Jorgensen, Chris Brown, Jasmine, Maeve, Bree Beecher, Sabraxis, Skylar Gray, Nathan Steele, Jane Packard and Chloe Dollar, Wen Dizzlebizzle, Gretchen Badger, Geek Filter, Bush, Celestial Dawn, Din, Sarah Bastam, Polly Mina, Jacob Tovar, Piston Twisted Garage, Lily, Jean Methune, Andrew Lamori, Lisa, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy, Corey Honkinen, and KT Dunn. Thank you so much to all of you. You're quite literally making my dreams come true, so I, I cannot tell you how thankful I am.